Hey everyone, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's get started on this lecture with a matching exercise. So go ahead and hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back and we'll discuss what you need to know about the IBDs. Alright guys, here are the correct answers. If you need to fix anything, go ahead and hit the pause button and do so. Otherwise, you know, you're guaranteed, almost guaranteed, I don't want to say guaranteed, almost guaranteed to see multiple questions on the IBDs on your exam. So let's run through, let's compare and contrast the main info you need to know about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now, starting off with where we'll find it. Remember that while ulcerative colitis is limited to the colon and is seen in a continuous manner, Crohn disease will affect any portion of the GI, basically from the mouth all the way to the anus. And it typically happens in a non-continuous manner. And one way to definitely tell the difference between the two is that ulcerative colitis always involves a rectum. Crohn's typically skips the rectum. So that's something to keep in mind, can really tell you a lot about what we're dealing with. Now, if we look at both diseases from a macro perspective, Crohn's disease is characterized by transmural inflammation and that classic cobblestone appearance. It has the presence of linear ulcers, fissures, and bowel wall thickening. Whereas from a big picture perspective, ulcerative colitis is typically limited to the mucosa and the submucosa, and is classically going to be described as being friable with superficial and or deep ulcerations. Now the loss of hostra seen in ulcerative colitis is another classic of finding on imaging. Typically they're going to describe this as a lead pipe appearance. Now, microscopically, Crohn's disease is characterized by the presence of non-caseating granulomas and lymphoid aggregates, while ulcerative colitis lacks granulomas but demonstrates crypt abscesses and ulcers as well as bleeding. That's a big sign. Now, both of these are associated with malabsorption, which means they're associated with malnutrition, and they both have an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Now, Crohn's disease is more so associated with the formation of fistulas and strictures, ulcerative colitis is more so associated with fulminant colitis, toxic megacolon, and perforation. Now when it comes to presentations, remember that while ulcerative colitis is associated with bloody diarrhea, the diarrhea associated with Crohn's disease isn't always going to be bloody. And so that's, I think I mentioned that a, 10 seconds ago, it's a really good point to keep in mind in case you get some significant GI problems, but the diarrhea is non-bloody. Really important to remember that. Now, one of the most common types of questions that we see with these two conditions are the extra intestinal manifestations, things that happen outside of the GI tract. Um, and one of the common findings you see with Crohn's disease is the precipitation of both kidney stones and gallstones. Um, and the main finding tested with respect to ulcerative colitis is going to be primary sclerosing cholangitis, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we get to uh, the gallbladder. Um, now, remember, you need to remember um, that primary sclerosis and cholangitis is associated with MPO anca and P anca. So they might give you that in a vignette, so keep that in mind as well. Now the kidney and the gallstones that we see in Crohn's disease may be positive for ASCA antibodies. Now, those are their specific extra intestinal manifestations. They may also have overlapping findings outside of the GI tract. You might see arthritis, rashes, oral ulcerations, as well as inflammation of the eyes. Now the treatment for Crohn's disease includes the use of steroids, azathioprine, antibiotics, and biologics. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, the mainstays of management include 5-ASA, 6-mercaptopurine, infliximab, and of course, colectomy. Now another condition I want to just throw here, throw in here, um, it's in your books, is microscopic colitis, which is a possible cause of watery diarrhea characterized by normal appearing colonic mucosa but will histologically demonstrate inflammatory infiltrates in the lamina propria with thickened subepithelial collagen bands or intraepithelial lymphocytes. Now, one last thing I want, you to I want to remind you about is IBS. Remember, IBS and IBD, although they sound the same, are vastly different. IBD is characterized by significant problems, um, but IBS is characterized by um, typically bloating, constipation or diarrhea, uh, changes in stool frequency. Um, there's no actual abnormalities uh, 
associated with IBS, right? It's a syndrome. It's, it's something that we can't really explain, but there's a variety of findings. Now, remember, you're also going to see this most commonly in middle-aged women, uh, and the best way to manage this is with uh, lifestyle modifications. So things like increasing fiber intake, um, increasing water intake, uh, if they're not drinking enough water. And if you, they've identified any triggers that worsen the symptoms, make sure to also avoid those triggers. All right, let's move on to the next question. We have a multiple choice. So go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. And we will discuss the correct answer. The correct answer here is C. Now remember that appendicitis is characterized initially by that diffuse periumbilical pain that then localizes down to McBurney's point, which is one third the distance from the right ASIS to the umbilicus. Now patients often present with severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and fever. Now it's important that you recognize easy ways to test for this in a clinical setting. We can uh, do the SOAS sign, the obturator sign, the Rothsing sign, and if patients have guarding or rebound tenderness, these are also very you know, specific findings associated with um, appendicitis. Now, in adults, the most common cause of this is obstruction by a fecalith, while in children, the most common cause is lymphoid hyperplasia. And management, of course, is with an appendectomy. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind is they may, it, let's say we're dealing with a younger female. You always want to consider things like ectop ectopic pregnancies, um, because oftentimes they'll use someone who is at risk of ectopic pregnancies, but they give you the signs and symptoms of appendicitis, and they're trying to distract you with the common signs and symptoms. But just remember that you want to think of what anatomically is located down in the same area as the appendix, because that could also be a cause of the problem. Okay, let's move on to the next question. We've got a multiple choice. Go ahead and hit the pause button, figure it out, and then come on back. All right, your correct answer here is E. Now, it's important that you know how to differentiate between di diverticulosis and diverticulitis because they are commonly tested on exam day. Now, first, remember that a diverticulum, this is simply an outpouching of the GI tract that communicates with the gut's lumen. Now, we've got false and we've got true diverticula. The true diverticula is one that involves all layers of the gut. The false contains only mucosa and submucosa. Now, acquired diverticula make up the vast majority of diverticula, and these are going to actually be false types. Now, when it comes to diverticulosis versus diverticulitis, very, very simple to remember. Diverticulitis, itis, is inflammatory. Inflammation hurts. Diverticulitis is therefore painful. Diverticulosis, on the other hand, is non-inflammatory, so there's no pain, but there's bleeding. So itis is painful with no bleeding. Osis is no pain, but there is bleeding. Okay, simple. Now, diverticulosis is commonly or more commonly seen in older individuals, and this results from an increase in the interluminal pressure and focal weaknesses of the colonic wall. And not only do you see this in older people, but you see this in people who eat a low fiber diet, diets that are high in fats and red meats, and those who are overweight or obese are also at increased risk. Now, when it comes to diverticulitis, remember, this is an inflammatory process, and it's associated with left lower quadrant pain, fever, and because it's inflammatory, leukocytosis. Now, since it is inflammatory, we're going to manage this with antibiotics. Now, if you leave this untreated, it can lead to severe complications like obstruction or even worse, perforation. All right, let's move on to the next question. We're going to do some true-false questions, testing your knowledge on a variety of intestinal pathologies. So, as always with true-false questions, I'm going to stick with you here, give you a few seconds to answer each one, and then we'll discuss the correct or incorrect answer and whatever you need to know. So let's dive in with our first true-false question. So as always, true or false, go. All right, guys, what do you think? This is true. So the Zenker diverticulum is a false pharyngoesophageal diverticulum, and it is a diverticulum that's precipitated by esophageal dysmotility. Um, and that causes herniation of mucosal tissue between the thyropharyngeal and the cricopharyngeal parts of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor in an area anatomically known as Killian Triangle. All right, next question. True or false? Go. What do you guys think? This is false. 
it's actually going to be seen most commonly in elderly males. Uh, in addition to this finding, don't forget that some of the classic findings of this lesion include halitosis, dysphagia, and obstruction. All right, next question, true or false, go. All right, what do you guys think? This is false. Meckel diverticulum is actually a true diverticulum. And remember why Meckel diverticulum occurs? Because we have persistence of the Vitaline duct. Next question, true or false, go. All right, what do you guys think? This is true. We are going to find both pancreatic and gastric tissue as part of Meckel diverticulum. Now, the fact that gastric tissue may be present is why we can use the protectinate scan because that gets taken up by heterotopic gastric mucosa. Easy diagnosis if, if that's, in fact, the problem. Now, don't forget, we're most commonly going to see the Meckel diverticulum in the first two years of a child's life. Next question, true or false? Go. All right, what do you guys think? This is false. The most common congenital GI anomaly is actually the Meckel diverticulum, which is seen in around 2% of the population. All right, next question, true or false, go. This is true. A loss of function mutation in the RET gene is associated with the onset of Hirschsprung disease. Next question, true or false, go. All right, what do you think? This is false. So the sign that's actually associated with Hirschsprung disease is known as the squirt sign, which is characterized by an explosive expulsion of feces. The squirt sign, it makes sense. All right, next question, true or false, go. All right, what do you guys think here? This is false. So diagnosis is based on a complete absence of ganglion cells in the rectum on suction biopsy. And of course, that's due to failure of neural crest cell migration. Um, and the question here says decreased. So that, you know, you gotta make sure you read carefully. Now, proximal to this segment that lacks the ganglia, we have a normal segment. That is actually going to be dilated and we can see that on imaging. Now remember, this condition is typically going to present with abdominal distension, bilious vomiting, as well as failure to pass meconium within the first 48 hours of life that results in chronic constipation. All right, next question, true or false? Go. What do you guys think? This is false. It's actually associated with both obstruction of the duodenum and volvulus. Now, in this condition, the small bowel is malpositioned on the right side of the abdomen and it's characterized by the formation of fibrous lad bands. Next question, true or false, go. What do you guys think? This is true. And most of the time you're going to see this in infants whose uh, compromised blood supply results in intermittent but severe abdominal pain with current jelly stool. Next question, true or false, go. All right, guys, what do you think? This is false. The target sign is actually seen on ultrasound or CT in intussusception. Now, additional findings that you're going to see in intussusception will include that classic sausage-shaped abdominal mass, as well as something that I see all the time in a vignette, which is the description of the child drawing their legs up into their abdomen, which helps to relieve that pain a little bit. All right, next question, true or false, go. All right, what do you guys think? This is false. In children, the most common lead point is a Meckel diverticulum. In adults, the most common lead point is going to be an intraluminal mass. Next question, true or false, go. All right, what do you guys think? This is true. The midgut volvulus will be seen more commonly in infants and children Whereas adults, the sigmoid volvulus is going to be the more common type of volvulus you should expect to see. Now remember, the volvulus is nothing more than a twisting of the bowel's portion around its mesentery. And that twisting can, of course, cause both obstruction and infarction. And we've got one more true or false question. So true or false, go. All right, what do you guys think? 
this is true. Remember that I mentioned in the last question that adults are more likely to get a sigmoid volvulus. Well, this type of volvulus is associated with the coffee bean sign on x-ray. And if you want to get an idea of what a few of these look like, which I recommend you do, Google coffee bean sign volvulus, and you can see a variety of different uh, examples, which that is always a good idea to do. So, you know, if you are reading your first aid and you see an example of, let's say this, or you see a, a, an example of something else, don't just take that one picture and say, okay, I get it. Go and Google it and see what different types of the same thing look like. So you can sort of start to recognize patterns that will help you on exam day big time. Let's do a matching exercise and then we'll take a break. So go ahead and match the intestinal disorder with its correct feature. Hit the pause button, go ahead and do that, and then come on back and we will discuss these disorders. All right, here are the correct answers if you guys need to fix anything. Of course, hit the pause button, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, let's take a look at a few other important intestinal disorders that we need to know, and then we'll move on to discussing polyps and in the next lecture. So first up, we've got acute mesenteric ischemia. This is seen when a blockage stops blood flow to the GI. That is going to result in severe abdominal pain. Now, one of the most common ways by which they describe this is the patient is in so much pain but the physical findings that you see are sort of unremarkable, i.e. the pain is out of proportion to the physical findings. Now, don't look down at your books. I want you to tell me which GI vessel you're most likely to see this happening in. Don't look. The SMA, that is the correct answer. Hopefully you got that right. If you did, excellent job. If you didn't, that just shows you that, you know, don't gloss over these things because everything counts. Next up, we've got adhesions, which are simply the result of some sort of trauma. Oftentimes, that's going to be due to abdominal surgery. Now, the reason why this is so important is because this is actually going to be our most common cause of small bowel obstruction. And on x-ray, we're going to see multiple dilated small bowel loops. That is your classic finding. Again, Google it. Check out uh, small bowel obstruction um, because now that you know that adhesions cause that, you need to know what it looks like. All right, multiple dilated small bowel loops. Angiodysplasia is up next, and this is characterized by the tortuous dilation of vessels that you're most commonly going to see on the right side of the colon. And typically you see this in older adults, um, and it can be associated with a few things, end-stage renal disease, uh, aortic stenosis, and von Willenbrand disease. Now remember, a common presentation of angiodysplasia will be hematochesia. Chronic mesenteric ischemia is next, and this is a condition that's caused by atherosclerosis in one of our major arteries. So for example, the celiac, the SMA, the IMA. Now occlusion of any of these is going to affect a large area in your GI. And the way that this is going to present is with postprandial epigastric pain as a result of hypoperfusion. Now the reason why this is so important to recognize is because the degree of pain experienced is typically going to cause the patient to want to avoid food. Um, so it's also going to be associated with weight loss. So, you know, if they're bloating and they're in pain and, and they're losing weight, people might think cancer. You always want to keep this in mind though. Next up, we have colonic ischemia. And this is a condition caused by ischemia to those watershed areas of the colon, which hopefully you remember are the splenic flexure and what? The rectosigmoid junction. Now, a couple of details that you want to remember about this is that it is characterized by crampy abdominal pain that's followed by hematochesia, and that on imaging, we're going to see that classic thumbprint sign. The thumbprint sign is indicative of mucosal edema. Then we have ileus. Ileus is a commonly tested condition, and this is characterized by intestinal hypomotility without any obstruction. Basically, the bowels just stop propelling things forward. Now, patients with ileus will demonstrate constipation as well as a decrease in gas, as well as abdominal distension and a decrease in bowel sounds. Now, the thing with ileus is that there's usually a cause. So look for someone who's using opiates, um, someone who had recent surgery, because that could cause ileus as well. Now, the way this is managed, because really there's no anatomical problem, is with bowel rest, electrolyte correction, and if we want to get the gut moving along, if nothing's happening, using cholinergics can achieve that goal. Next up, we have meconium ileus. Of course, we talked about this before. This is associated with cystic fibrosis, and cystic fibrosis causes thickening 
of these secretions. And here we have very thick meconium, meconium being the first bowel movement, and it's so thick that it plugs up the intestines. That's going to result in an inability to pass stool. And remember, like I said, you'll see this. This is one of the classic signs of cystic fibrosis. Now, the last condition here in our books is necrotizing enterocolitis. This is a condition that we mainly see in premature formula-fed infants who have not yet developed a mature immune system. Intestinal mucosa necrosis leads to pneumatosis intestinalis, pneumoperitoneum, and the presence of portal venous gas. Now, you're going to see this affecting the terminal ileum and the proximal colon the majority of the time. All right, let's take a break. I will see you guys on the next lecture.